start with time. So um, we have two excess ESG papers, starting with the hardening of ESG, presented by Geneviève Inesia. And uh, we have 20 minutes for presentation, 20 minutes for discussion. Remaining 
again, this doesn't work. If the wound is again don't constrain over the externalities, and this is the case when it comes to having to follow the rules of the game, and it's the case of Volkswagen, or when it comes actively in the society's ability to fight the rules of the game, like in the, in the case of uh, Exxon Mobile. And this is, you know, of course, a problem for society, for the sustainability, and for sure, because there are also religious um, problems. And so this came. Um, you know, this discussion came, you know, in, in the decade after the uh, global financial crisis in their majority, and really called, you know, the economic model into, into question. Um, I give you an example of a survey of uh, Germany in 2019, <coughs> where the uh, understanding of capitalism, what are, what are the, uh, what are the feelings about capitalism, is very, it's very negative. And this was recognized at the level of the World Economic Forum uh, by the OECD. And was the ground on which the debate about the purpose of, the, of companies de developed. Corporations, of course, reacted in a very forceful, uh, in a forceful manner. We all remember the US roundtable statement of August 2000 and, uh, 2019, um, and which was matched by similar statements in Europe. I give here just one example in the UK uh, of the better business company. And if in practice, what the company uh, did is that they you know, sort of made commitments uh, outside of the mandatory framework to employees, communities, and uh, environment and carbon emission reduction in particular. You know, and we have to name a few like government companies, you know, Total Schnell, Michelin in France, or Alice in Germany, we you know very much at the forefront of the uh, climate change. And this was very much encouraged by asset managers, property advisors, industry investors, and activities. And the two main groups that corporations took um, in order to make those commitments and for those commitments are the following. On the one hand, disclosures or announcements. Um, typically, you know, here's what we are doing towards net zero, here's this what we are doing for communities, and also voluntary sort of extra care or oversight. Namely, um, looking at you know, the chain of value and, and referring their different <coughs> condition to so called human rights standards. So, typically, Apple has, has taken it through in a very forceful um, way. So, what can they do? Well, this is just you know, corporate strategy. Of course, they react. You know, they are something you know, that actually don't bite very much. Um, uh, and, and this is very much a pre uh, preemptive step of strategy. You know, it's very easy to make sure that you know, regulators don't feel that they need to get in because there's already a response. But this didn't go this way because an uh, ESG hardened through regulatory measures did, did happen or is happening. And we can describe this as opportunities because you know, those, those things can be, can, can be described as a way to tackle the issue of sustainability. These legal requirements um, actually very much followed, and this is the first but interesting observation, very much followed the corporate commitments. You know, they focus on oversight through corporate rule measures and on disclosure through separate security rule measures. There are other parameters that also exacerbate uh, corporate externalities, but they've been left uh, on the side. You know, we could have been of limited liability, um, but you know, of course, in the case to entrepreneurship, that's in touch, uh, political party financing and lobbying in you know, many jurisdictions is still, you know, still, still there. Short terrorism hasn't been necessarily tackled head on either. So really the focus is on oversight and disclosure, just like corporate corporations had um, had started to uh, to or had initiated. So in continental uh, Europe and at the Level, um, there are a few, um, many things that can be, that can be mentioned, and, uh, and I will do so. With um, um, with the following observation is that you know after Brexit, Germany and France have become the leading voices and almost unchallenged because you know, the UK, which perhaps has a different taken capitalism, is and it's not around the table, it's not around the table anymore. And France and Germany have a rather pro uh, stakeholder. So Germany, you know, violent capitalism, is a meat vegetable, 
part of a governance of good is being part of it. So the decision making, uh, you know, a long standing concern for our environment has not very surprised, you know, has, has come into 2021, uh, from this statute of protection of human rights along the value chain. Quite a surprise, but very different from what we will see at the EU level. France, uh, starting in 2017, is a war, so an act duty of vigilance for parent uh, companies uh, that also you know, sort of relate to specific change. And this, and the one I want to tell you about, more about is the 2019 World Pact on Global Transformation of Companies. <coughs> Why do I want to talk about this one? Because I think it's an <coughs> illustration of the first challenge. Writing, you know, that are actually meaningless, and it's a good illustration of that. Um, so the the War Pact uh, was really the brainchild of two great uh, leaders, uh, Alain Seymour, who was the head of Michelin and head of Renault, and Emmanuel Faber, who uh, was uh, head of uh, Dalmanet you know, since Aussie. And this, uh, this, this two, these two people. Um, Inspired a report that inspired the law that for the first time introduced a framework for managerial decisions. There was until then there was nothing in French that could really tell uh, executive managers and uh, directors what, what to do. So now it's codified and it's multi tier. So two things you have to look at. First, the uh, corporate interests. So the board determines the corporate strategy in line with the corporate interests. This is not in the code. And second, stakeholder interests. It's also important when managing the company. Which I have regarded of its activity. And here, again, as you can notice, there is no guideline regarding the hierarchy between, between the interests and how to coordinate them. And it's, just as a side note, it's interesting to note that um, they, um, the inspiration for Senar and Faber was English law. Well, you know, England law, you know, English law, they have this section 172, you know, it's all about. Um, stakeholders, you know, stakeholders are mentioned, you know, because this is process just mission impossible. But it's possible that they got slightly lost in translation, how they understood uh, section 172, if we see the way they uh, translated it in, uh, in But, you know, France being France, okay, let's go further than, you know, what can be done uh, in those uh, address, in those transitions. And we're going to introduce a third level in the decision making framework. So this is the raison d'etre, literally the reason for being. So since 2019, articles of association may specify a reason for being, consisting of the principles which the company is endowed with and for the respect of which it intends to allocate means in carrying out its activity. So it doesn't read better in French, not bad translation. <laughs> um, so what is this idea of this raison d'etre? <coughs> into the articles of association, you know, elements that you know, companies that I, I used to I used to talk about I used to put together usually in retreats for the employees, you know, team building, but now now it's now it's in now it's in the now it's in the articles of association. So Atos was the first one, Atos was at that time was in the uh, one of the top uh, 40 organizations uh, in France, uh, put in its um, in its article of association following statement, our mission is to help shape information space, with our skills and services, to support the development of knowledge, education, research, and multiple approach, and contribute to the development of scientific and technical excellence. All of the world we enable our customers and our employees and more generally the greater number to make work and progress to stay with the different companies to his information space. Article of association. And actually many companies sort of uh, uh, for the group and took this opportunity offered by uh, the legislator, which by the way didn't need to be a need to be a to do it, but they, they took this opportunity and now 60% of the top uh, French uh, companies have such a lesson that in the articles uh, of association. So what is the impact of this lesson? Well, when I said it's quite an anti norm it's much too big to provide to provide Even in the French law, it's easier to uh, get to the, to the director of the France. In English law, you know, it's just so great. You know, there, there is you know, the protection of the, the, the functioning together of the business law makes it so that it's, you know, it's not going to happen. 
um, is also likely to enable uh, a unity of uh, board decisions or, or contracts. And anti takeover defense, that could be an idea. Suez tried to exploit it, so there was a very brief deal about this case. This case, Suez Veolia, in December 2020, Veolia, uh, which is a waste and water management company, uh, announced its intention to buy a block uh, in Suez. And Suez also indicated uh, that it would then uh, take over, uh, and Veolia sort of indicated it would take over Suez afterwards. And, because there would be competition issues, Veolia uh, committed to sell the French uh, um, water business. And, uh, and, and the board of Suez had the following answer. Well, you are telling us you are going to sell the Suez French water business, but Suez French water business is an essential component of the group. It's at the heart of the strategy. This is the raison d'être of Suez to have this really good business. So you can't do that. You know, this is so this is so serious that actually we are going to, you know, sort of um, make it impossible by transferring the shares of this business to the Dutch Foundation and Grand Foundation, the better way to go over the disposal of, of the shares. You know, with the goal and why? Because the foundation can do this, the foundation can do this because this is the raison d'être of Suez. In other words, you know, it's a strict, you know, making uh, the merger uh, impossible. You know, imaginative, well thought, uh, but uh, a court um, uh, ruled that uh, uh, this was not uh, that decision was uh, not uh, that, that actually a court ruled that uh, Suez was prohibited from uh, such a such a movement was just designed to prevent the other from carrying uh, the table uh, uh, but, you know, Veolia learned this lesson, so they also now introduce a raison d'être in their article of association to resource in the world, and they are now ready to fight any takeover attack in commerce. This is a colloquial. Um, I'm interested to see, you know, that there's, there's a lot of reason, there's a lot of talks about uh, concentration in the banking sector in France, so, you know, credit card has this um, uh, raison d'être working every day in the interest of of your customers in the society, it could just be sort of raised in a, in a bit, you know, it might not be compatible with the DNA of, 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 uh, of, of other, other banks. Well, so to, to summarize this first challenge, so let me say that the statutory raison d'être is, is, is meaningless, you know, is it bound to be an anti -mode? So as we just saw, there are limited corporate effects, there are also limited even ethical when we can be done is there's a discrepancy between the actual result and the official uh, you know, how to assess it, um, um, is it even is it even you know, and how it can you can sort of uh, do anything about it that been mentioned by the board. Uh, I recently talked to an Atos, if I remember the first uh, the first uh, user of uh, the statutory raison d'être, I told, I recently talked to a, a board member uh, who told me that for the past nine months, which has been very difficult for us, to have kicked out of the uh, uh, CAC, CAC 40, etc. Mm -hmm. the raison d'être has never been mentioned at their weekly or bi weekly board, uh, board meetings. So it's, what, what is the raison d'être? It's a political measure, really. It's a response to the critical uh, background of the uh, post crisis and the crisis of potentially an issues of the code civil and it's a corporate communication tool. And in a way, the, Na the French National Assembly recognized it, recognized it, saying that it was a legislative hook for companies that wish to recognize missions beyond their code civil. So I'm, I'm not sure whether the legislative hook is really where the mission of uh, the legislature is. But, you know, Danone got it right. You know, if their raison d'être in their French website is just a business model in their American uh, website. Um, at, if, we, if we look uh, quickly at the European level, uh, there are also opportunities that have been seized through the, uh, through the hardening of the ESG. So, you know, with this framework of the EU for the year of 2019 and the EU Sustainable Financial Package of 2021, you know, very ambitious uh, plans, you know, perhaps trying to you know, adopt the shock therapy to force institutional gate, gate, gatekeepers. Um, and Focusing again uh, here on disclosures and on oversight. 
here is you know, uh, really in a, in a parallel, uh, parallel development. So what I'd like to tell you uh, quickly about is the Cooperative Sustainability Reporting Directive, which is applicable uh, from uh, 2024, and its uh, taxonomy. Because I think that here we are, you know, we're seeing an illustration of the other challenge, you know, the opposite challenge from an empty, meaningless uh, rule, <coughs> which is an overly taxonomy, like, you know, too much. So the starting point is, you know, if we want uh, disclosures on sustainable, we need to know what is sustainable. This is an important question. Why is it great for that question? How do you know that an activity is sustainable? Well, you can ask the company, uh, but there's, there's a great deal of risk of greenwashing and working to be sustainable. You can ask the information intermediary, but actually, you know, they seem to have different uh, assessments. You can use your own view, but it's also very difficult, so the data. So, the European Commission has an idea, or concluded, or, you know, very rationally, that the regulatory standard was necessary in order to provide a clear definition of what economic activity counts as sustainable, and develop for that purpose a system uh, of classification, the taxonomy of regulation. So, here, you know, here is the way it works. An, an activity is sustainable if it contributes substantially to at least one of six environmental objectives, and six on the other, the other they are. Plus, two conditions must, must, be, uh, must be met. So, do no significant harm to the other objectives and meet uh, minimum safeguards. So, for instance, if you are, you know, manufacturing car batteries, you might think, well, I'm contributing to climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation. Done. No, 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 no. Not done. We have to check in detail, you know, where you fit into the taxonomy. So there is a list of economic activities and performance criteria for each activity. Who establishes those? The group, you know, the wise man, <coughs> the man of uh, 57 members grouped into a platform of sustainable finance and that have um, you know, created this taxonomy, this criteria that are included in delegated re uh, regulations. So companies are, you know, sort of forced into this uh, regulated, um, uh, this, into this, uh, into this text, which is you know, very uh, bureaucratic, very difficult to understand. But, oh, but you know, for chance, there is, um, as you described, user-friendly uh, website with a taxonomy compass only two colors, uh, but uh, very precise, so precise and so technical that it's actually referring to appendixes, etc. that it has you know, <coughs> become very, very difficult uh, activity, very time consuming activity, to actually even determine whether your activities will qualify as sustainable uh, or not. And so will this EU taxonomy achieve its objectives? Can we trust standards that are developing develop a solution rigorous way? By this uh, people, how political are the standards? Um, it's a tax it's in the tax only to reach it because it's only it's binary. It's either green or not green. It's one activity, knowing that activities sometimes have layers and somehow you know and, and within these activities there are there are something that are less green and, and more green. Uh, what about uh, emission, uh, high emission firms that are lowering lowering their emissions <coughs> units? It's not going to be taken into account. What about international harmonization? So conclude and I'm going to just you know briefly into a, a third a third a third challenge. So between the sila of too little too vague at all and the characters of too, too, too complex and overly at all, uh, there is also the impact that is happening <coughs> as a report. Um, so you might think this is a yam yam Korean dance, <laughs> but actually this is perfect what they are doing. Those are the um, the support of media in the uh, in the um, in front of the, tri the Dutch tribunal that uh, gave a decision in 2021 against Shell, founding that Shell had reached an implicit standard of care, and that the standard of care that was not mentioned in, in, in Dutch law was actually to be found and to be deduced so interpreted on the basis of corporate commitments to UN guiding guiding inclusion. So it seemed that. French, you know, French sorry, and civil court, you know, are so, you know, you know, looking at legislation, applying, applying legislation, this is, this is their problem, suddenly got emboldened, you know, and sort of participate themselves into this hardening 
of, uh, of ESG, so constructing positive law based on soft law requirements, soft law um, uh, measures, and um, this is a personalization of law, so the standard of will be different for each company based on their, uh, based on their commitments, the form of reliance. but more uh, inspired by her draft paper which she shared with me. So I'm going to touch on some issues that go beyond what you spoke about, so in that sense, uh, maybe more complimenting rather than directly commenting. So in your uh, draft paper, you addressed two questions. Uh, first of all, querying the extent to which uh, the current uh, sort of generation of ESG stakeholderism particularly as practiced by capital allocating banks and funds, is in fact a sustainable business practice. And secondly, your other question, the legal and reputational risk capitalized by firms voluntary rush into amorphous commitments surrounding ESG, and you've spoken to some extent about those amorphous commitments already. It's a really important topic and a really timely uh, sort of paper that you're developing. So I really admire the admission of the paper and would encourage you to work with it. But because it's a draft, I'm going to give you some ideas where you might want to take it. On timeliness, first of all, so I thought I'd begin with highlighting a really pertinent European development. Um, so well known that the EU has tried to position itself as a leader in this area. Unfortunately, recently that uh, positioning has taken a bit of a knock. First of all, the, the US, the Inflation Reduction Act, the US throwing a lot of money at the problem and clearly seeking to uh, position itself in this area. And that's a problem for the EU, which has not been looking at money as a way to address these issues so much. It's complicated for the EU with its state aid rules. So it's been forced onto the back foot by trying to catch up with the US in this respect. And secondly, where the EU, EU has sought to lead is in regulatory leadership. And some of that is facing a bit of a backlash now. So one of the uh, developments that I would highlight is in the area of the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, which was on one of the other slides. So in that uh, regulation, the EU has sought to designate funds by reference to how green they are, either dark green, Article 9 funds as they're known, or Article 8 light green funds. So really setting a high standard in this respect. But that's run into very significant trouble. So quite recently, um, the European Securities and Markets Authority stakeholder group has described the Article 9 category, the dark green category, as effectively null. It's bounded by uncertainties, the standard's very high, and the market has reacted by just not seeking an Article 9 designation. So they're putting more and more into the light green Article 8 funds. And that's understandable from a risk management perspective market-wise, but it both undermines the coherence of the Article 8 category and empties out Article 9. So you can see that, perhaps, as an example of moving too fast and creating a, a regulatory mistake as a consequence. Now, I picked up from your paper that you're worried about hardening. You think there's something to be concerned about. And so you could take that article nine example as one that validates your concern. But at the same time, I think it would be a mistake to say, oh, well, then that means that the, the state, the public sort of uh, interest should, should step back here. Clearly, there is a role for the state for hard law as well as market initiatives and soft law measures as well. And so I would suggest that the task is not one or the other, it's about finding the right combination of measures. In some respects, I think I disagree with your paper 
in so far as it takes a quite negative view as to hardening and hardening being challenging um, because I take this view that you need to have all forces, you know, these are the world's biggest problems facing us, you, you need everybody, all sources of uh, uh, kind of regulation uh, impinging on it. And I also think that actually uh, we shouldn't exaggerate the extent to which norms are hardening in this area. Actually there's a lot of industry uh, influence, uh, so the next paper coming out of this one, we'll talk more about that. So, um, with those thoughts in mind, I want to just focus in a bit more on hardening, which is the core concept that you use. Now, hardening is a familiar idea, and it's often used to describe the process whereby something that starts off as a guideline, a code of conduct, or some other norm, gradually acquires formal legal force. So it could be an industry code practice, could be some supervisory guidance, could be standards agreed at the international level. And we know that there are many driving forces behind the creation of those norms. So industry wanting to demonstrate that it can self-regulate to stave off uh, a formal intervention, or industry wanting to get itself out in front to pre-structure regulatory standards. And indeed, there's quite a lot of discussion in the literature that that's the situation that we are in now, that actually whilst sort of things are becoming harder, they are still reflecting the norms, the values, the approaches of the industry, and in ways that could potentially mean that we end up with hard law that is not aligned with the public interest because <coughs> we appreciate by industry too much. The tendency to harden that exists within a lot of soft law norms, particularly at the international level, is one that can be deliberately exploited for strategic reasons. So again, at the international level. So soft law standards often used be precisely because they are soft, they allow for different degrees of readiness, they allow for exceptions, reservations, phase-in periods and the like but less of the wariness of countries to actually agree to those standards in the first place. And generally, not to that seem to be a, 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 a advantageous thing. So, to some extent in your paper, you do use hardening in that sense, that gradual process of moving from a voluntary norm to something that acquires legal force. To the extent that you see this as challenging, at one point when I read your paper, I wondered whether you were actually saying there's something to be worried about even in having soft law voluntary norms. And there are some traces of that, you know, some of that in the literature suggests that you know, we shouldn't be kind of trying at the international level for soft law standards because that just kind of um, stifles experimentation, amplifies regulatory mistake. And there are some references to mistake and to crowding out of private sector initiatives. In the end, I don't think you're fundamentally criticizing soft law, and I think you're right not to do so, because clearly there is a room for and a need for soft law standards in this area. At the international level, many of the factors that have been seen to justify the use of soft law <coughs> in this area, so kind of dealing with global problems, and borders, creating efficiencies for firms, all those factors are in play here as well. And the reason why I think you're not fundamentally questioning the process whereby uh, sort of norms emerge at the international level is based on what you say is the interaction between uh, the, the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate uh, Related Financial Disclosures, or the new emerging uh, international sustainability standards and how they are being applied used in the EU. I mean, the International uh, Sustainability Standards Board is pretty clear that it wants its standards to harden, so it talks about you know, sort of jurisdictions building on the global baseline, the advantages for companies in that, and also um, the efficiency and comparability benefits for countries as well when they incorporate them into their jurisdictional requirements. And in looking at the EU's 
importation of those standards, you do say that it's advantageous to that it will help generate a much needed effort to reduce the amount of paperwork that companies need to comply with. So you do see some benefits to standardization. So when I really read your paper closely, I saw that what you're worried about when you talk about hardening as a challenge is more to do with the pace. That you're worried about uh, a quickening trend, the accelerated pace of hardening, the stampede to embrace ESG. And some of your comments then make more sense in that when you talk about uh, French law, when you talk about German law, you're already talking about systems that, in their hard law, are already quite stakeholder in their orientation. You describe them as stakeholder cultures. So we're going from one version of, of stakeholder law to uh, a more ESG-friendly version of stakeholder law. But it's all variations on hard law. And equally, the same the debate about 172, I wouldn't myself see that as an example of hardening to 172 in the UK. I see that as we have one version of an attempt to embrace stakeholder interests, a rather weak one in the UK, with some discussion around uh, the form in section 172 to make it more uh, explicitly stakeholder in its orientation. So I think I would first of all suggest that maybe look, bring out more clearly that when you are talking about hardening and particularly the challenges of hardening, that you are, are more upfront in saying that it's not about tracing the patterns of non-binding, normatively worded instruments for hardening into formal law, but rather that it's about the pace at which this is happening and the dangers that you associate with that. Let me develop that a bit more in the context of your first question. So you're worried that capital allocating banks and funds are engaging in a form of stakeholderism that is not sustainable. Well, I've said already that the Article 9 problem in the EU context could be taken as a really salient example of that concern. On the other hand, I don't think you can uh, dismiss the whole of the utility of hard law in this area just by reference to one example of the EU getting things wrong. And I also think that there's room for a more nuanced understanding of how the public sector, how central banks, how regulators and others can contribute in this area in ways that involve a range of tools, not necessarily simply looking to a legislative solution. So let's think about banks and asset managers specifically. Now, of course, they've all been very vocal in a, you know, sort, of, uh, sort of demonstrating their green credentials, and that's great. And to some extent, we should call that, you know, no actor in this space can plausibly think of itself as the only game in time. But at the same time, you know, of course, the, the business incentives of clients and asset managers to follow through on their promises can't be assumed. So you need something else behind that. Um, you know, we all want the banks and the asset managers to ensure that investment flows to the most uh, uh, sort of socially productive use to accelerate the green transition. But we can't ignore the fact that those capital allocators are prone to greenwashing. And indeed, earlier this month, the European supervisory authorities issued progress reports on how sort of greenwashing was sort of manifesting in the EU markets. And their analysis shows a clear increase in potential cases across all sectors. And the reports really make a rather sobering reading. We can't assume that the private sector will um, invest the optimal amount of resource needed to kind of navigate the bewildering way of private sector standards. Um, we can't assume that, um, uh, that they are best placed to develop the right tools for measuring some of these issues. And those tools around measuring climate risk, uh, maybe I could talk about just a little bit more detail. So if we look at you know, market discipline, and the ways in which that won't work 
to ensure the capital flows to the firms that are best placed to drive transition. Yeah. Mark Carney has talked about the tragedy of horizon, yeah. the spending today to curb harms that will really only manifest themselves in the future is always going to be suboptimal. Long, long time horizons, uncertainties, catastrophic consequences, yeah, they're not amenable to the finance industry's established risk management toolkit. So really, those need central bankers and supervisors to recognise climate emergency as a risk to stability and to act in response to that. So here, I think just drawing this part of my uh, thought together, I would say that um, you know, you're right to identify the quickening of the hardening process as something that we should be paying attention to. Um, but I would urge you to introduce perhaps some more nuance into your analysis of that. First of all, to find room for the spaces for productive interaction among multiple overlapping communities, legal systems, and to look more carefully at the procedural mechanisms and the institutions and practices that enable all these systems and communities to work together. Secondly, I suggest that um, soft law norm norms, they're often and usually just a starting point for national laws, and they are subject to a great deal of variation in how they are implemented, how they are overseen, how they are enforced. So I wouldn't exaggerate the risk of negative uniformity, especially in this area, sorry, this era, fragmented geopolitics and heterogeneous preferences. <coughs> Achieving meaningful agreement is pretty hard in itself. You know, the EU and the US are not converging towards a single solution to ESG issues. There's regularly hard name, yes, but that doesn't imply regularly uniformity. So there's divergence within convergence, as we hear more about in the next session. I also look more closely at the, the process of hardening and the way in which the public sector can contribute, other than by the enactment of formal rules. And there are lots of really interesting examples there. Yeah. I think the way that the Financial Stability Board actually sponsored and facilitated the work of the task force and climate related disclosures. A really example of how the public and private sector work together. I think the network of central banks and supervisors for bringing the financial system, which is a, you know, a network of central banks uh, around the world, including South Korea, yeah. really working on best practices, working with economists and others to develop um, climate risk uh, scenarios that can be built into uh, 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 stress testing and other matters, and producing over a course of around two or three years, you have three different refinements of those uh, case studies and stuff. Now that's doing stuff that the industry isn't able to do on its own, other than the right centers. Um, but it's not moving straight to uh, a legal rule, but it is very much working within the public space, along with the private space as well. So there's a lot of great thinking there. Um, um, and, and much to sort of build on and, and, and to think about. I'm going to say just a few words by closing on your second uh, issue. So your second concern was to be worried about this voluntary rush into commitments and how that is giving rise to legal and reputational risk. I think that's a really important issue as well and a separate paper perhaps on its own as well. You know, fascinating questions about the relationship between public and private enforcement option, about the role of tort law in this area, about the evolution of fiduciary duty at the asset management level and also at the uh, board level as well. And you know, on the one hand, of course, you know, the, the courts must have a role to play in ensuring that ESG commitments aren't just talk, they do translate into real action. On the other, a rise in lawsuits, particularly private lawsuits, will come with its own problems. Uh, you know, growing consciousness across the sector, the sector of the increased risk of enforcement and litigation, 
That's fine to shift thinking with ESG initiatives. Could have a chilling effect. Could make boards ultra cautious and defensive. <coughs> See the Article 9 example again. Not going for the Article 9 designation because of the litigation risk associated with that. Or take the example of insurance companies that have left the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero uh, against the background threats of anti uh, sort of trust sort of litigation. So some contents are already in this area, talking about um, you know, as, as disclosure expands, do we need to think about the threshold for actionable emissions? Do we need safe harbors? Should we even sort of preempt private enforcement of climate-related disclosures as a better approach to allow that space for disclosure to develop? Um, if you go down those routes, then there's a way of connecting your two points. On the one hand, you're concerned about the hardening of law, but you're also concerned about the potential explosion of private lawsuits in this area. But if you want to manage private litigation in this area and the enforcement uh, considerations in this area to allow firms to disclose uh, at the socially optimal level, then you need hard law. Might be unique to have legal intervention to ensure that um, we don't end up in a situation where um, <coughs> litigation risk is actually having a chilling effect. And it is interesting to note that it's not new climate laws that are often being used as the basis for enforcement, it's existing laws. So I use the UK example, Section 172 director's duties to be there for quite some time. That's the basis on which the most recent prominent case has been brought to court, a case against uh, the directors of Shell, um, allegedly being in breach of their 172 duty. Um, uh, uh, so the transition plan was not ambitious enough. That case was thrown out. But it does illustrate the point. So I do think we need public intervention. We do need some harmonization. Otherwise, you get too much noise. We have that problem at the moment. I think you also do need to think about um, the way in which hard law can moderate the risk of too much sort of uncontrolled litigation in this area. Because if you don't, we just leave it to be a regulation by enforcement, then you have unstructured uh, uh, sort of developments, which ultimately, I would suggest, raise costs for firms, dealing with that litigation uncertainty, legal uncertainty coming in there, and ultimately, in the worst case scenario, decreasing the speed towards mobilising capital, towards the green transition. So in other words, there's an awful lot of very rich material in your paper, or what may be in the end, multiple papers. So I really enjoyed reading it, and I look forward to seeing how it develops. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I have what I think might be a very basic question, but when I think about what the EU is doing and what ESG the movement has been aimed at for the most part, I wonder, is the regulation coming out of the EU um, more aimed at externalities and stakeholders, or is it aimed for investors and aiding private ordering? And it seems to me like it's mostly the latter. And that's why we see the things that you've um, heard in the commentary about like the light green category, and the climate disclosures, et cetera, their disclosures or categorizing the investments. And I wonder if you might reflect a bit more about the implication of that, that um, what you see as regulators, instead of regulating what are the actual underlying concerns of the negative externalities related to climate, they're instead engaging in a process that's complicating in many ways and diverging approaches around the world um, seemingly aimed at facilitating private ordering. Um, I have a question about enforceability of uh, these duties. So obviously, uh, even though Rua Pax imposes duties of uh, taking care of the social and environment effect, it looks like Omisho still can sue uh, about uh, the breach of liability, not the stakeholders. 
So I, I think I found it as a regulatory greenwashing or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but while I learned that um, on the uh, Guard Division also, uh, there are some cases going on in, in France, called French court, maybe 10 cases are going on against the company like Total or Suez. So can you explain a little bit about the, the difference of the Guard Pact, where um, it focuses on the uh, di director's duties and vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, uh, Division also? Yeah, so I uh, had three questions. I think the first question with regards to hardening, I think you seem to draw a distinction between uh, yeah, soft law and hard law, but even if there is a hardening of ESG in terms of law, in terms of the making of the laws, but we know that you know there are rules and standards and the the laws can be developed in more in the form of standards, which makes it even which makes it soft in a hard law disguise. And even within hard law, there is also compliance explained, for example, the UK modern slavery legislation. Uh, it's, it is a, stat, it's a statute, but then, you know, companies are of a certain threshold are only required to disclose uh, whether or not they have complied uh, with the um, modern slavery legislation. And they can shoot, and they can actually say that we have, we have not complied. So that, that is actually soft law in a hard law disguise. And even if there is hard law in terms of rules, um, if there is irregular enforcement or absence of enforcement, as what Jun said, that would actually make the hard law soft. And I think the second point with regards to clarification, because you, you use ESG in a very broad sense that en encompasses the EU you know, corporate sustainability reporting directive, the EU uh, Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence uh, Proposed Directive that also includes business and human rights measures such as the, um, you know, the France, uh, the French Due Diligence Legislation and Germany also recently passed the Supply Chain Due, uh, due Diligence Legislation. So I wonder if you could clarify a bit what do you mean by ESG, sustainability, business and human rights, it seems it's all is caught under the umbrella of ESG. And I think for hardening, it, the third point is that it, um, it hardening of ESG in terms of, you know, the making of the laws and as well as in terms of statute, as well as judicial pronouncements. But I think, for example, in Asia, in certain uh, jurisdictions or by the state, has a big role to play. The hardening of ESG takes place through state intervention, through state pressure, state influence that does not necessarily translate into legislation or judicial pronouncements. So that could be another kind of hardening, but in a different form. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, one, one thing that I think is very interesting about this hardening is that it's, on the one hand, like there are legal mandate, mandates, but it, they're very qualitative. So we're talking about like light green versus dark green, rather than numerical. Uh, and I don't know, you know, why, why that is, but it's sort of, it's a very particular type of, uh, of hardening, and I'm curious you know, to hear you think about why, why we're not going to like the next level of hardening where there are actually kind of numerical requirements or something. So I'm afraid we, uh, we're running out of time, so we, uh, you'll probably have to pick a few uh, questions to respond to. In case those were too hard, I have a few additional <laughs> easy ones. <laughs> so, um, so I wondered if you could speak about what exactly these companies mean by commitments to net zero? So are they, you know, are they going to burn a pile of money in case they don't reach it, or is it more of a you know, strong word? And the second question is, um, so why, why two shares to the Dutch Foundation to prevent a takeover? Why was one not enough? That's a bit of a technical question, but I mean, I'm curious. So the third question I had was, what's the role of the shareholder composition in driving the adoption of the whole debt fund? So in the case of pretty Agricole, it strikes me as not surprising that they would have consumers interested in mind, given they're owned by their consumers as a cooperative. And I wonder if there's a more general point there. 
So again, we don't have time to answer all of the questions, but you can choose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you so much for all this, uh, all this uh, thoughts and, uh, and comments, and I hope you know we'll have opportunities to, to discuss for more, more than 30 seconds. <laughs> right. um, and um, I'm going to answer the, the easiest question, why two shares, because two shares were enough. And that, that's it. So it's just, it was enough to, to do that to give the power to the uh, to the Dutch uh, Foundation. And I think the core, you know, many of these comments get to, to, to this to two points. First, perhaps you know, I need to explain how the impact. It's not only about soft law becoming hard law. It's also about this. Um, it's also about these corporate corporate commitments uh, uh, being sort of. Um, Taken, o taken over by, by, the, by, the legislator, by the legislator. So it's, it's, it's hardening perhaps in a less technical sense. Perhaps I should think of another, of another, um, of another, of another term so that there is no, um, no confusion. And I think that, this is my second and last point, you know, fundamentally I think you know, what I'm describing is the fact that the objectives are very, you know, has, the objectives are very ha um, hazy. Because ESG is hazy, and I'm not the first one to uh, express it. You know, someone in the room, uh, as you know, wrote a whole paper on expl ex expl ex explaining, explaining that. And and when you have such a you know such a starting point, the result cannot cannot be good. The result is either too vague or trying to correct the objectives in you know the objectives that were defined within 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 the uh, within the regulation uh, itself, which is not the right, which is not the right, uh, the right place, the right, the right place. And I think this is the core, um, the core issue. Thank you. That's examines corporate law through an international or a transnational lens. And we want to explore shareholder stewardship, particularly in the ESG area, through that lens, through that transnational lens. And we do it by looking behind the curtain of individual shareholder activism and seeing what we call this uh, ESG, global ESG stewardship ecosystem. Now, that might sound as if it's a fairly dry topic, but it's anything that but. Yesterday, those of you that uh, attended the conference heard from uh, Professor uh, Jeffrey Gordon, where he talked about what's going on in the US, and he talked about how he thought you had to de-link climate change from the rest of ESG because there is so much backlash against ESG uh, in the US uh, today. So, I'm going to tell you what Tim and I feel are the major contributions that our paper is able to make to the literature in this area. Um, there's a lot of literature in the area of uh, stewardship and shareholder activism and institutional uh, investor activism, and much of it is written by people in the room, including, alas, our commentator Dan. Um, and what we feel that we are able to bring to the table of this literature uh, are basically three things. First of all, we want to highlight the scale and the scope and the influence in public company governance of this vast ecosystem that we think is lying behind individual examples of activism and is providing incentives and pressures and leverage on institutional investors that are contributing to stewardship. And I think that what we're trying to do uh, is consistent with what Professor Chung said yesterday about that you can't have tunnel vision and just look at one aspect of the corporate governance in this area. It needs to be more holistic. I'm not sure that we go the full spread of your talk yesterday, 
But we do try to pull that curtain aside and see what are those incentives that are driving institutional investors and what are the leverage uh, potential and the leverage limitations on institutional investors. And I think this affects the way that we see corporate law and corporate governance. Because traditionally, we tend to think of corporate law as national law. And for all the finance people in the room, you'd be very aware of this as a result of La Porter et al's study. That was a study of horizontal show and tell and particular jurisdictions cherry picking from other jurisdictions to find what are the, the best protective mechanisms for shareholder rights. We're looking at something different. We're looking at you know, not the horizontal jurisdiction to jurisdiction, we're looking at something vertical that then has implications for individual jurisdictions. So the second thing that we think we bring to the table in this study is we think it challenges, our, our paper challenges some of the assumptions under the agency capitalism paradigm, uh, which many of you will be familiar with, with Professors Gilson and Gordon and also Beck, Chuck, and Hurst. And so what are those assumptions? Well, they're assumptions about the presumed lack of capacity and incentives for institutional investors to actually undertake uh, effective stewardship and effective activism, and particularly that of indexed investors. And so in this agency capitalist model, the, the default position is that they will be these institutional investors will be rationally reticent. They'll be looking at what is economically rational uh, and they'll only engage proactively if it makes good economic sense to do so. Now, how does this compare with the historic image of institutional investors? Well, back in 1991, Professor Gilson and Krapman, they wrote a Stanford Law Review article, Reinventing the Outside Director, in which they said the traditional image of institutional investors is this paper colossus, alternatively greedy and mindless, but in all events, a less important corporate constituent than the other kind of investor, the real shareholder. Now, you know, it's obviously better to call uh, institutional <coughs> investors uh, rationally reticent than it is to call them uh, alternatively greedy and mindless. But I think both these images um, say that they're not going to have a very effective role in corporate governance. And certainly the traditional uh, image of them as being greedy and mindless uh, tends to say they will always side with management. You know, they're just not going to be a player. And so we think that we challenge that. I mean, in current developments, we see the, the ExxonMobil activist campaign that you're all familiar with. Um, we see there that the shareholders, the institutional investors become kingmakers. We have a recent example of that in Australia. Um, and you know, the institutional investors were also kingmakers in this activist campaign against AGL, a big resource company in Australia, very recent. Um, but under the agency capitalist model, the assumption is that the institutional investors are not always going to be supine. They can be activated into action by hedge funds. And of course, it was a hedge fund, engine number one, that was at play in the ExxonMobil campaign. In the AGL campaign in Australia, we don't have much hedge fund activism in Australia. Uh, we don't have any activist hedge funds that come into Australia. It's not unknown, but it's fairly rare. Um, and in this case, it was a woke bloke, a young billionaire with a ponytail, who went in against AGL, put up four directors that he said, you know, had climate change credentials. Management of AGL fought vehemently against that. And what was the result? All four were elected. The institutional investors voted. They went to his side. Um, you know, there was a battle to get them. The voting was phenomenal. 83% in favour. 86% in favour. Huge levels of support uh, for the ponytailed woke blokes campaign. But in our paper, we also show that it's not just a case of different paradigms applying outside the US in terms of who the leader is, 
we also show that often the institutional investors are doing this for themselves. And not only are they the ones that are starting these campaigns, they're doing it collaboratively with other institutional investors at an international level. And this is really changing uh, the scene. So we think that our paper challenges that widely accepted view of agency capitalism, which is a very dominant paradigm in the US, but which we say doesn't reflect what is going on in terms of activism outside the US. And so we, we think that has quite important implications for investors' capacity to engage in corporate governance, the systematic stewardship, uh, and for the relevance and impact of institutional investor stewardship codes. Uh, now, Eilish mentioned that uh, the third way in which we think our paper contributes to the literature is in this area of the convergence-divergence debate. Because you might think that if you've got this vertical um, development occurring, that it will go towards harmonisation. But as we've seen with this development of the ESG backlash in America, we cannot at all assume that that will be the case. So um, just the final point I want to make is in relation to stewardship codes. And we talked a lot about stewardship codes yesterday. And in transnational ordering literature, talks about uh, issues of problem framing and who writes the rules as being very important in terms of convergence or divergence. And because stewardship codes have been introduced for different purposes in different jurisdictions, Dan yesterday talked about constraining excessive risk in the UK code versus trying to put a bomb under Japanese managers to take risks in the Japanese context. Um, and so we see very different con contexts in these stewardship codes. A lot are now putting in place ESG, um, but nonetheless, the focus differs on how much they're putting in. And so these kinds of problem framing are going to um, make their, the divergence within convergence. Uh, and they're also, you know, there's this issue too of are stewardship codes driving activism or playing catch up? Tim and I address that in a different paper, and we think that the stewardship codes are actually playing catch up, not driving. So over to you, Tim. Thanks, Jennifer. And can I start by echoing Jennifer's thanks to the organisers for giving us an opportunity to present our paper. So, um, as Jennifer's indicated, uh, investor action designed to prompt public companies to, um, to address ESG issues or ESG stewardship, as it's commonly called, has become um, prominent in a number of markets across the globe. Now, um, academics have identified various reasons for this phenomenon. Um, several commentators, for example, have said that um, for diversified institutional investors, it can make um, considerable sense to focus on ESG stewardship to manage systemic risk. Other commentators point out that there can be material commercial benefits for investors in engaging in ESG stewardship. There's evidence that there's consumer demand for that sort of um, strategy from investment managers, and evidence also that they can, investment managers can charge higher fees, for example, for offering those sorts of investment products. Regulation and soft law are also playing a, a role in focusing investors on, on ESG stewardship, and Jeff has just mentioned steward, stewardship codes, for example. Um, and possibly moral or ethical considerations may, may drive some investors, such as faith-based funds. Um, but in our view, these factors don't provide a complete explanation for the global prominence of ESG stewardship. We argue in our paper that there's also an important cross-border or transnational dimensions to this phenomenon. And in our paper, we call this the global ESG stewardship ecosystem. Uh, and this so-called ecosystem is a collection of diverse organisations which collaborate across national borders to promote corporate accountability on ESG issues. Um, the key members of this ecosystem are, are, noticed, uh, are noted there on the last point on that slide, um, international agencies, so for example, um, the UN and its agencies, advocacy organisations, by that we mean um, non-commercial, non-governmental organisations engage in advocacy around environmental and social issues, so 
um, share action in the UK is an example. Institutional investors, uh, associations and networks of institutional investors. So an example of that is Climate Action 100 Plus, and the commercial service providers of institutional investors. So engagement firms, data providers. So. Um, these are the constituents of the ecosystem. Um, and in our paper, we discuss their, their activities and, 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 and how this ecosystem operates. For the purpose of this presentation, I want to emphasize three key features of the ecosystem. And I want to start, uh, for, for reasons of emphasis, with the second point there on that slide, um, which highlights the fact that the organizations which comprise this ecosystem uh, they're not operating as, as isolated and random actors. Um, instead, like in any other ecosystem, they are acting in a coordinated or, or networked way uh, to exert influence in relation to ESG issues. And we highlight various examples of this in our paper. And, and just briefly, we discuss, for example, how the UN and its agencies have a deliberate strategy of, of, of engaging with capital market participants to further the UN's sustainability objectives. Um, we also note how advocacy organisations like Share Action um, will bring together groups of institutional investors to pursue issues such as child health, climate change concerns, um, and investor networks like Climate Action 100 Plus bring together institutional investors from across the globe um, to deal with um, climate change issues. And next, the next key feature is that these organisations are acting at a transnational or cross-border level. Um, so those examples that I just mentioned, we have the UN and its agencies working with capital market participants from across the globe. Um, the example of share, um, uh, share Action, the groups that it convenes involve institutional investors from across the globe and so on. This ecosystem operates at that transnational level. And the third key feature we want to emphasise here is this ecosystem is, is driving important developments um, both at the normative level and on the ground. So by, by normative level, I mean the ecosystem is playing a key role in shaping expectations, objectives and norms of conduct across global markets about the need for public companies to take action to address material ESG issues and of the um, importance of investors playing a role in forcing companies to accept that responsibility. And if you'd like to see an example of this, have a look at the website of the UN Convene Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance and the publications there, which include various publications about ESG stewardship, including publications regarding best practice in this area. And in addition, as we say there on the slide, this ecosystem is driving developments on the ground. Uh, and by that we mean that members of the ecosystem are engaging in or otherwise supporting um, activism, um, uh, attempting to drive change in, in, in public companies to address um, ESG issues. And an example of that are the campaigns that are operated um, through Climate Action 100 Plus, targeting uh, large com companies in, in markets across the globe. And this on the ground significance of the ecosystem like this is reflected in, in developments in some jurisdictions where concerns have been raised about um, whether this coordinated action is, 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 is infringing competition and antitrust laws. We argue in our paper that the ecosystem and its activities have some important insights and implications for corporate governance scholarship. So first, um, the activities of the ecosystem highlight how um, collective or coordinated action is, is, is placed um, a, an important role in driving ESG stewardship. Um, and this finding about the central role of collective and coordinated action um, echoes other recent scholarship which has highlighted the increasing significance of collective action in the in, in public company governments. And I've noted a few examples there on the slide. Now, institutional investors are the common thread across much of this collective and coordinated action. They join initiatives launched by the UN. Um, they engage with advocacy organisations like Share Action. Uh, and they work with, engage and work with service providers to undertake um, their ESG stewardship in markets across the globe. They are central to the ecosystem. And that leads to our next 
painting site, which is this collective action exhibited by institutional investors as part of the ecosystem, suggests that we need to refine previously advanced arguments, which Jennifer mentioned, um, about institutional investors being radish, um, rationally reticent and dependent on the initiatives of others um, to become involved in, in public company governance. Um, instead, the collective action that we see in the ecosystem involves strategic and self-organised behaviour by institutional investors, um, and, and they're anything but reticent in this context, and it's important to appreciate that they are at the heart of this activity. They are not merely responding to initiatives proposed by others. And this insight prompts the question noted in the next um, point three there, which is, well, where will this trend towards collective action take us? Will we see investors become more proactive across a broad range of commercial and strategic issues? Or are there topics or issues where collective action becomes impractical? For example, because it's too difficult to derive um, sufficient consensus to allow investors to proceed collectively. Uh, and we think this is an open question which merits careful consideration because amongst other things, the answer to that question is going to be relevant to um, working out the governance power of institutional investors and whether we should be concerned about that governance power. And finally, um, an examination of the ecosystem highlights how many of the expectations, principles and practices in relation to ESG stewardship uh, are being shaped by transnational influences, not just local practices, no, not just local factors. And in our paper we say that this is an important point for national lawmakers and regulators to appreciate. In particular, if national lawmakers and regulators decide um, they can stay on the sidelines and let the market drive developments in relation to ESG stewardship, it is likely then that the content and practice of ESG stewardship is going to be shaped to some degree by this transnational ecosystem. Also, if national lawmakers and regulators decide to uh, pursue some sort of a regulatory initiative which is open-ended and aspirational, again, they may find that the ecosystem fills in the gaps and, and, and defines how that's implemented in practice. And so for jurisdictions that adopt that approach, uh, we think we're likely to see the ecosystem drive a degree of convergence in relation to the stewardship. And if national lawmakers and regulators don't like the prospect of that, well, then they're going to have to consider developing their own more prescriptive domestic arrangements in order to ensure that they define how the institution of stewardship occurs on their own terms. So on that point, um, I'll be Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's wonderful to, to be back at GCGC and I always have to start with thanks to Elaine and Suzanne. Um, and it's absolutely terrific to be back at uh, Seoul National University. Um, in addition to that, uh, Professor Konchik Kim, uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for, for everything. Um, I've been to GCGC and I've had the pleasure of commenting uh, several years. And normally, um, I'm given a task which, for a simple lawyer like me, is uh, very difficult, you know. I, I always say when I come to GCGC, it's the only time in the year where I ever use the word endogeneity. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, asking, again, a simple lawyer like me to read a corporate finance paper is, you know, akin to acting, uh, you know, asking a, a sumo wrestler to sort of walk on stilts, right? You know, whereas you corporate finance people, it's like riding a bike. So this year, I thought I was given a treat, you know, because it's my first law paper. Um, and, and I don't have to deal with it. Right? So I thought this is going to be very easy. It's very simple. Until I opened it up, and I saw that it's Jennifer and Tim's paper. This presented an enormous problem for me. I almost withdrew my thanks from Elaine. <laughs> you know, and the reason is, um, the first is that uh, I really love the 
and so it's hard to make uh, your 20 minutes meaningful when you love the paper. But I had an even bigger problem with, which has to do with Professor Umakan Veratova. We've written a, a draft of a paper, and we cite this paper about 10 times. So the more I criticize this paper, the more I will have to redraft my own paper. <laughs> so I'm sort of hamstrung by this. So I'm going to try to keep this quite simple and straightforward. Um, and there are three sort of points which I think are incredibly important about this paper, which I've nicely color-coded with the blue heading. Um, and then there are three points which um, raise some questions in my mind about this paper. So the first terrific thing about this paper, and I think this is a development that is, is going to be with us for some time. The classic corporate purpose debate, as we all know it, at least for lawyers, was do you put ESG things inside your corporate law proper, or do you keep your corporate law proper focus on maximizing shareholder value, and you allow environmental regulation or le legislation about diversity, um, agenda rights, to be left outside of the corporate laws. But that, that has been what the debate is about. And why I think this paper is so terrific, and it builds on Mariana Pargendler's uh, paper, which is, uh, for those of you who may not have seen it, but I, I suspect most of you have this idea of international corporate law. But this gives meat to that idea. And why it's so important, I think, is especially in smaller states, so I'm from Singapore, right? Um, it's, it's now critical not just to talk about what well, is the state going to put this in the corporate law or outside, because you may have BlackRock, State Street, Fidelity, Vanguard, coming into your market and you are forced to adhere to this law. So it's another driver of the law which Tim brought up at the end, right? This is a potential driver um, that is, is, is not within your choice that you're, you're making because it's out of the hands of the jurisdiction. In other words, this becomes a very global, international problem. Right? And so I like that about this and I assume There'll be a lot more written on this. Uh, I can't speak for the business school people, but in the law field, I think there'll be a lot more written about um, uh, how the implications of this. The second main point is this idea about rationally reticent. Right? And so much of the literature, of course, the starting point, at least in the US and the UK, was this widely dispersed. We know that's all gone. But then, really, at least as legal scholars are concerned, or, or maybe I'm concerned, maybe I'm biased, um, you know, the Gordon Gilson idea to, to explain what goes on in the United States, and you have these rationally reticent um, institutional sh uh, shareholders. And, um, you know, that, that, that idea has become entrenched in the way we understand at least the United Kingdom. Uh, and the United States, and, and indeed beyond that as well. And the question that they raise is, um, you know, the, the, the famous way of describing institutional investors in the United Kingdom was that they were the sleeping giants of British corporate life. This is the whole idea behind shareholder stewardship, to change the incentive game to wake up the sleeping, the sleeping giants. And what they are claiming in their paper is that indeed ESG changes this incentive basis. In other words, the sleeping giants have now been woken up by ESG. Now, again, I think this deserves a lot more research because on the one hand, the giants may be awake, but are they doing anything? Are they greenwashing? Right, um, and, and it's, it's this sort of faux awakeness, or are they actually uh, awake and doing 
the hard work of ESG? I think that's another question. But I think it's incredibly important that they've at least raised this. And a few other people have raised this, uh, uh, Paul Davies in, in our shareholder, Global Shareholder Stewardship book. He has this uh, great chapter, and the subtitle is um, From Saving the Company to Saving the Planet, to explain how the UK pivoted with the 2020 version of the Stewardship Code, um, and how this movement may actually be changing the incentives. Now, to empirically test this, I leave it to many people in this room, but I think it's a, a terrific question. Uh, and, and there's a lot of uh, wonderful descriptive evidence uh, within the paper and examples that, that, that raise this question of whether the incentive has changed. I love that we were talking about hardening because you know I searched for my pictures, so I thought this is uh, you know as good as you can get for hard law versus soft law. Um, and I don't, want to, I don't want to belabor the point, yes, but this idea of what hard law and soft law is incredibly fascinating. Um, I was talking to, to Ben Goto uh, in the break, and I, I can add another example of hard law and soft law in the context of Japan. So as many of you likely are aware, even non-Japanese law experts will be aware if you read The Economist or New York Times. Um, Japan has faced a lot of pressure in terms of gender diversity on boards uh, because they have many boards which have no women. And um, the, the, the pressure has been coming a lot from institutional investors um, making campaigns as to, to say that we are going to vote against every single Japanese company that has no women on their boards. Now the question that their paper raises, um, and they don't bring up this example, but I've added this example, is, well, what should Japan do? If Japan wants to occupy the regulatory space, Japan could actually pass hard law. They could put in a requirement, which some jurisdictions in the world have done, a quota requirement. They could harden it, right? And they could occupy the regulatory space that would take some wind out of the sails of you know, the, the proxy advisory firms um, and, and the institutional investors, right? And then they would probably almost go away. The Japanese would, in essence, gain control over their own system. And so I really like this point in the paper, which is that um, you know, if we look at the last several decades of the spread of corporate governance around the world, we all know that it's been, and I'm putting the U.S. aside for a second because the U.S. is almost always its own animal. Um, uh, it's been through corporate governance codes, right? About 100 countries have corporate governance codes. The most recent iteration of corporate governance codes have been stewardship codes. These are all very, very soft. They're comply or explain. Most stewardship codes are even softer than that. They are, they are voluntary, meaning you have to first decide you're, you're going to sign up, then you will comply with it. Right? So this has been extremely soft, and now the question is for jurisdictions, do you harden? Right? Do you harden because you don't want BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard to be determining in your jurisdiction what the social norms are? Now you can debate the, the gender issue within Japan, and there's a vigorous debate. You can, ask the question of whether this is being imposed from the outside, whether this is, resonates with Japanese culture, whether Japanese culture has changed. There's a huge debate there. But the question is, do you want to determine this on your own? And so I do see that there is this new impetus for hardening that may go on uh, in the world. So those are the, 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 the beauty points, yeah. Uh, now, now we get into uh, so, some things that I find a bit, a bit more challenging. Um, is this ecosystem really global, right? And, um, or is, is, it, is it less than that? And I'll just pull out um, three quotes from the paper. I, I don't need to do this because they already sort of mentioned this, how fundamental they say institutional investors are to this global ecosystem. 
right? And you know, they say in the paper, although the global ESG stewardship ecosystem comprises a myriad of actors, institutional investors are at its core. Institutional investors lie at the heart of this Byzantine configuration. The institutional investors' power in this regard has led to their description as, and I quote from here, but they mentioned it in the presentation, kingmakers. Now the question I raise is, are institutional investors the kingmakers around the world in this global ecosystem? And out of laziness, I, I use a slide that I used yesterday, so I apologize for people who were there. Yes, but um, you know, if you look around the world, um, in Asia, right, uh, institutional investors on average hold 11% um, of, of, of the, 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 the stock market. In some jurisdictions like Singapore, it's as low as 6%. So clearly, in these jurisdictions, it's not institutional investors that are driving this ESG movement. Now, I want to be very clear. I am not suggesting at all that ESG isn't a big issue in Singapore. What I'm suggesting is that it is being driven by domestic or controlling shareholders. I'm not suggesting that ESG is not a big deal in China. It is. But it's being driven by state-owned enterprises. So the question then is, who are the kingmakers? And we know that the kingmakers around most of the world are controlling shareholders. Right? They are the kingmakers. Which raises my second related point, which is, um, well, I'll show you the statistics on the kingmakers. Right? You, you, you see here that in the United States and the United Kingdom, right? Um, you. <coughs> You have most of your companies, right? Um, ah, actually, I messed that slide up. Um, <laughs> the statistics are that uh, in most jurisdictions around the world, right, controlling shareholders, about 70% of the market uh, is in fact dominated by controlling shareholders. So controlling shareholders are the key makers. Um, and of course, the United States and the United Kingdom uh, are different in that regard. Um, so, Ultimately, the question is, is there a global ESG stewardship ecosystem, or are there many ecosystems? And I would argue that there are several ecosystems in the world. Even in their paper and in their presentation, they mentioned that the idea of the, the Gordon Gilson model doesn't exist in Australia, right? So you don't have a lot of hedge fund activism of the hedge fund and then it being um, you know, backed up uh, in an engine number one type of scenario. But I would say those are ecosystems that are maybe like the Lapagos Islands that are somewhat close together. But if you move to a much further away island in the Galapagos, right, you're going to have different creatures, much different creatures. And I would suggest that if you go to China and you look at the CCP, um, you, will, you will have an interesting ecosystem. Now, I've, I've done a paper on this recently about institutional investors in China. Very fascinating. Maybe 20 years ago, institutional investors made up less than 1% of the market. Now they make up 20%. How much does BlackRock, State Street, Fidelity, Vanguard own in China? Less than 1%. They are pulling the levers. Okay, so there's institutional investors. Institutional investors also are pulling the levers. We all know who pulls the levers. Right? This is a different ecosystem. China on its own is a different ecosystem. Okay? Um, and, and that works very differently. Um, jurisdictions that are dominated by family firms. Singapore has a stewardship code for family firms. Um, again, that is a, it's a different ecosystem. Right? So ESG is being driven by different things. And so I think it, it is right to think about ecosystems. I'm not saying to drill this down just to the jurisdiction level always, but I think there's more than one driver here. There are several drivers. Now, so I had trouble finding this image now, but there's this great new program. It's like ChatGPT for art. So Valley. And I typed in a panda in the boardroom. Yeah, lots of elephants in the boardroom, but no pandas. Yeah. Um, so, uh, or elephants in the room. So wh why am I saying a panda in the boardroom? Because um, China, as you know, um, is the second largest economy in the world, by some measures the largest. 
Um, the capital markets are the second largest. Uh, global Fortune 500 companies, um, 20 years ago, China had almost none. Now, on my recent count, they outnumbered the US by two. Um, and um, as I mentioned before, institutional investors have been a project of the CCP for two decades, but serve a very different purpose and are entirely Chinese dominated. Um, I just, when I opened the paper, the first thing I did was I searched China. I came up with a zero. I searched Chinese. I found it in one footnote referring to a Chinese company in Australia involving an Australian case. So why do I say the panda in the room? Because I think now when we're talking about the globe, maybe as much as we're uncomfortable with tensions in politics, um, you know, I think it's, it's China should be included, um, it should be discussed. Uh, it doesn't obviously fit into the ecosystem because they have their own ecosystem. Yeah. But it's an incredibly fascinating ecosystem. And, and if you look at ESG, it has been a project uh, of, of the government there. Um, we can debate how the project works. We can debate, uh, as many people do, there's a huge literature actually on, on this, uh, whether it's working. Um, you know, uh, but the fact is that if you go back to 1994, uh, when the Chinese Company Act was first put in, the modern one, if you go to 2002, when the Chinese Corporate code, uh, Governance Code was first put in, if you go to 2018, where the more recent Corporate go, uh, Governance Code was put in, they talk about sustainability, they talk about the environment. Uh, this exists. Yeah. So we have to engage, right? And, and I think that this is um, incredibly uh, important to do. Um, and, and that would be my last, um, my last remark. So I end, um, yeah, I think I have one minute according to my clock, uh, with, with one minute only just to say um, it's a terrific paper that raises issues which are fundamental um, to, to comparative corporate governance and, and these questions will drive a lot of future research which is the goal of any wonderful scholarship so I want to congratulate them uh, for doing a terrific job. And um, just that these are additional questions. Um, you know, um, I hope I will conform to what Professor Kim said with Professor Goto yesterday, which is that um, I'm at least polite, but perhaps not diplomatic in pointing things out. Uh, um, but, uh, uh, but really, I love the paper, and uh, I, I, I think it, it's a terrific thing for a springboard for future scholars. Thank you very much. ecosystem is the right term for what I understand your thesis to be. To me, it seems more like the global cabal of ESG entrepreneurs. Uh, <laughs> and why, why do I say that? Because ecosystem evokes this idea of uncoordinated action that often we think is in equilibrium, a healthy ecosystem is in equilibrium, whereas here, we seem to have directed action, conscious action, trying to change things, and it's sort of a different kind of phenomenon. Yeah, I, I want to go to the um, uh, rational reticence question. Um, obviously, that paper um, had, you know, had, a, had a positive prediction, right? It was a theory that this was a rational thing and therefore this is what we would expect would happen. Um, and I get, and that could be inconsistent with what you found, or it could be consistent, uh, or it, it could be consistent, uh, I'm sorry, it could be, uh, it, could, it could be that, uh, in fact, what you found is, 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 the, is the fund equivalent of greenwashing. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering, what it is incentive-wise that you think is going on with the funds that make you believe this is not fund-type greenwashing, but something real? Yeah, that's uh, Mike, so I guess I'm, I'm supposed to speak. So uh, 
variation of Mary's point. Um, so I didn't read the Gilson, Gordon, Patrick Hurst, and also Kahan and, and Roth contributions as such that they're saying there's nothing happening. It's just uh, they're saying it's not optimal what's happening. So the incentive structure is such that, of course, you portray yourself as doing something as a good steward. That has always been the case. Unfortunately, in the empirical studies, the Latin variables that you use did not lend much support to that claim. And, and so the question is, what's indeed different here? And are we not just observing something that you know, is very similar to what we observed in the, war, in, the, in the times when we were just concerned about governance issues, that of course you portray, portray yourself as doing something, and you're doing something which is um, you know, saving on costs, but it's still, from the social optimum perspective, not exactly what, what we would expect. And therefore, um, isn't there a danger that, um, you know, buying into this narrative that they're doing so much, much good without testing it empirically, uh, we crowd out the real regulatory intervention that we might need? Um, yeah, I like your observation on the global dimension of the ecosystem. So I'd like to point out um, the, there is a similar but uh, a little bit different dimension as well. Uh, that is the extraterritorial application of some national or regional law. For example, the EU imposes many regulations on the environmental or renewable energy, for example, the carbon border adjustment mechanism or early 100. And um, the companies in Japan, Korea, and China, or Taiwan, that export products to EU have to comply with these requirements. It's not based on consensus, but just a sheer enforcement of the law, but it affects the, uh, the, the agenda of the institutional investors and even the fiduciary duty of the Korean and Japanese um, the, the company. So how would be uh, considered in your analysis of the global ecosystem? Um, hi, thank you. Um, uh, I think this is a, it could be a, a little uh, a dumb question. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, how would you think about the investment return of uh, an institution investor who uh, actively exercise those ESG type of stewardship? Um, the reason that I'm asking this question is because um, I think this is somewhat related question, you know, by other people. Uh, but what is the economic um, incentive for those ESG or you know, um, institutional investors to actually make those ecosystem or this coordination sustainable. What is an equilibrium force that makes this equilibrium sustainable um, and prevent not from collapsing by deviating from you know other people? Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. So you talked about this ecosystem extending beyond the SG, but my question was about uh, within the SG, whether this ecosystem is developed across E, S, and G to the same extent, or whether you need to sort of disaggregate and think about it in a more kind of uh, uh, sort of you know, detailed way. Okay, so, so I'll take my corporate finance hat and, and say something about, you know, endogeneity and reverse causality. Um, so, so, so I think one interesting thing here is that uh, stewardship to some extent is a reaction to the, um, the failure of hard laws, uh, but it's also a reaction of the success of hard laws. Right? So you have the EU taxonomy, and the EU taxonomy will create uh, various uh, hindrances for businesses outside of Europe, and that can be the basis of more stewardship based on that fact. Right? So, so I think there's a you know, going back to reverse causality and the genetic, I think there's some endogeneity the here. So the ecosystem is not uh, that of the cabal. It doesn't, it doesn't survive by itself, right? I think it's being fed by other players that you were not actually listing in, in your, in your, in your, uh, in your uh, paper. So the other issue is that this reverse uh, or, or um, uh, endogeneity between stewardship and ownership structure. So in many parts of the world, I think uh, there are concerns about stewardships and this is actually hardening the, of, or fossilizing the ownership structure uh, in, in private ownership, in family ownership, and governments are actually supportive of this, and going back to Dan's point, and it's not just in Singapore or in China, I think it's everywhere in, 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 
Asia, I think there, there are more and more concerns about what you term ecosystem uh, or cabal or you know, whatever it is that, that we are worried about here. Right? So, so and, and one word that I would, I would highlight here is the, is the word colonialism. And that's the word that we are worried about here. I encourage you to think about uh, uh, disaggregating different types of ESG and thinking how much are the global concerns uh, kind of colonialist or imperialist uh, versus, uh, versus, so like climate change on the one hand, wherever the carbon's emitted, you know, the externality is totally global. While if I'm an American fund and I'm coming into a different culture and I want a certain, you know, gender norm, then that's uh, that's a, that's a different uh, that's a different sort of thing, and I, I don't know I'm not sure how much this tracks, uh, but uh, but it's just something that I think would be interesting. Um, yes, so when thinking about this global aspect of stewardship, um, just to give you a, an example um, in the lending space or, or investment space, many of these um, different uh, stakeholders they use the science-based target initiative as a, as a means to really provide very concrete decarbonization paths. So it could be the case that this uh, global stewardship, they all feed into the same source of information and therefore they are all pushing towards a very uh, coordinated type of uh, alignment. So, okay. um, I think a lot of the benefits, like there's been a lot of focus on the benefits of PSG stewardship. I think lately there's also an emergence of potential costs, um, especially like in the US with the backlash that you see against some S and E uh, initiatives. So I think it will be interesting to explore how different costs and different, you know, you know multi um, national investors like BlackRock that, um, might suffer um, higher costs in the US. Whether you see bifurcation of uh, of policies, or you're gonna kind of like mute the entire uh, uh, policies across the board in different um, uh, places, rather than just in the So, uh, yeah, uh, I was also interested to see if you would also like to uh, examine a bit more about how these networks actually operate, who initiates the actions, how they make these decisions. Uh, because that might be an interesting way to think about how the idiosyncrasies of specific investors can be kind of neutralized. And I was reminded of uh, the recent decision of the English uh, courts in the Client Earth Shell case, where the fact that Client Earth and the other investors who sued were part of Climate Action Network was seen as a negative. Because the court said because of that they've already made up their mind and therefore they're not acting in good faith. So uh, that may be also useful to think about. Um, so, I think I have one question and a comment. Is the, the question is that whether the three features that you mentioned, uh, which is transnational, coordinated, and normative and on the ground, um, is that, do these three features, are these three features reflected in China? Because I'm actually uh, looking at some of the Chinese pronouncements uh, by the government, and the Chinese government actually announced that in 2021, it made ESG an important role for promoting SOE's performance of CSR. So they have slightly different understanding of ESG. And the second thing is that they are very driven to promote ESG and to make ESG reporting compulsory because they are angry and worried about the, uh, the foreign ESG rating system that has disparaged and devalued Chinese companies. And this is partially what's driving them you know, to promote ESG. And secondly, they have actually co-opted ESG and they say that this ESG will actually help to solve China's social and development issues. So it seems that it is not, it's a bit different from you know, how it has been understood in different parts of the world, you know, how they have co-opted the language and how they have made it and how they have institutionalized it and how, is it, how it is party driven. Um, yeah, I, thank you. These are absolutely fascinating questions. There were too many of them, you know, because we've got lunch, right? So we're going to go through them quickly. I just wanted to say a number of the questions 
really go to the heart of what we talk about at the end of the paper, which is this p potential clash between the global standards and the local. And a lot of people have been talking about, well, you know, the legacy of colonialism and, you know, maybe everyone agrees with the E part, but not the S and the G. And I think that is absolutely fascinating. And also, Umikant's point about, um, you know, I've already said to Tim, I want to write, was, you know, a joint paper on who's Zooming who, who's driving this. And one thing we haven't talked about in the discussion is the fact that it's often a local institutional investor that will then attract these global gadflies that will come in and join. And we didn't talk about the very well-known Australian Rio Tinto example, um, which crossed E, S and G, and it concerned when Rio Tinto blew up an ancient Aboriginal site. And the Australian institutional investors got upset. They couldn't do anything on their own, but they gradually gathered the, the international institutional investors to come on board. And so I think that you've given us a huge amount of fodder to look at those clashes that are going to be inevitable. Um, and I think it's going to be really interesting. And I, I also thank Dan very much for you know, bringing up this point about China and, and also Ernest, the point that we might have to talk about political washing as well as greenwashing and influence washing. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of the, the comments and questions referred to China um, as being the panda in the room. Um, and I accept that. As we were writing the paper, I actually had the US in my mind as the elephant in the room. Um, uh, in, in sense of you know, how is this ecosystem um, interacting with a major capital market? Um, my sense is it will be making some inroads, but the size of the market will <coughs> determine its influence. So we had the US in mind as we wrote the paper. I accept that China is, is, is something that would need to be considered as well. Um, some of the questions uh, um, sort of drove at a, at, a, at a common issue, and it was really, um, you know, how does the ecosystem work across E, S, and G? Is it working the same way across those three elements? Um, um, the, answer, the answer is it's not. Um, I think it's working um, uh, more consistently across the climate change aspect of ESG. I think you see a lot greater variation on the S um, uh, within jurisdictions and certainly between jurisdictions. Um, and that, I think, feeds into a couple of questions about what are the incentives driving this? I think. Um, Probably to answer that question carefully, um, you need to break it down and look at um, how the ecosystem is working across E, S, and G. I think across um, E or climate change, the incentives are what have already been um, identified by other commentators, such as managing risk, um, appealing to investors, and so on. And there, the, the incentives are the same as identified, but the ecosystem comes along and the collective nature of the ecosystem comes along and leverages those pre-existing incentives to um, amplify investor voice on that. Um, I think around S, for example, the incentives at work there are, um, are, are hard to get, to, get, to get a grip on. Um, and I think uh, if that was made two points, I want to be responsible. And I would just say, of why did we call it an ecosystem rather than a cabal? Um, cabal didn't come up with the thinking of a title, but you know, thank you, Holger. Um, I think what we're really trying to get at, and this was a point that was also made in the questions, is how many different moving parts are going on and how difficult it is to predict with, with backlash and with the interaction of hard law and these incentives in the background. Um, we, we can't in any way predict the way this will all pan out, but we're trying to unpack the different levers that are making a difference and that you know it's really worthwhile keeping an eye on. So um, it's lunchtime, I think. <laughs>